believe we are all oh, wait, correct. vaccinated. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh, this Anyone who is not vaccinated? My, I just lost my phone. Don't worry. Good. Good. That is so weird. That all right, we are live and ready to go when you are. Good evening. I would like to call the Henrietta Town Board Workshop meeting for May 24th, 2021 to order. Please call the roll. Council Member Barley. Here. Council Member Stafford. Here. Council Member Safranic. Here. Council Member Bolzner. Here. Supervisor Schultz. Here. We'll begin tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Hey, Becky, I have a prompt on the screen up here. Thank you. I think Thank it was you, just Don. the notice that said that the uh, meeting was being recorded. Uh, so Wednesday, we have four special use permits. Um, three are restaurants. Um, the fourth one is a hookah lounge. Um, so look up, read up on that one. Um, I don't know where it falls under... I mean, obviously it can't be, at least my understanding is it can't be dealing with cannabis today, but I would like to have a discussion with them. We should take a look at and start thinking about where we will want to allow cannabis because uh, if that's their ultimate goal, it makes more sense for them to wait and open up in one of those designated areas mm -hmm. uh, rather than open up here and then have to move. Kind of crazy, but in other countries, they have hookah right in the restaurant where you eat your dinner. Right. Yeah. Didn't we, wasn't there a hookah lounge in Henrietta Pryor? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I forgot where. Henrietta where? Wasn't that? I'm pretty sure next to the former Abid's Deli. Oh yeah, there was, there was one something there. over there. Yeah. yeah. Where was that? Um, on West Henrietta Road, just north of the intersection with um, Calkins, on the west hand side. Okay. Yeah. There yeah. was a deli there and a Chinese restaurant. That's where the Caribbean, and the hookah lounge. The Caribbean restaurants going in, right? The Caribbean seafood restaurants going in over there. I honestly don't remember. Um, okay. Yep. But the the lounge moved somewhere else, and I believe the Chinese restaurant doubled in size, is what happened. But I'm not positive on that. Interesting. So, um, what, are there going to be any issues because there's a. a church right next door? I've got to do more reading up on what constitutes a hookah lounge and what occurs yeah. in there. Yeah. Obviously, from a cannabis law standpoint, it would be an, an issue. Yeah. I'm understanding what a hookah lounge is just sent to tobacco. Well, and if you let a hookah lounge there and then the cannabis comes out, are they going right. to just... Right. That's what I... That's my right. point is if that's their exactly. goal. So go ahead, right. Craig. So yeah, I'm sorry, Craig Eckert, Deputy Town Supervisor. My understanding is that a hookah lounge is just scented tobacco. Mm -hmm. right. um, is what? I'm sorry? Scented tobacco. It's just tobacco. Oh, okay. So that's why in some restaurants, I believe it is allowed in some areas. But, you know, that's, I don't, I've never been in one, so I don't know if that's a generality or if there are other items. Well, and that might be a generality in the U.S. prior to legalization of cannabis. Correct. Because I also know that hookah lounges can include ca cannabis. Well, and is that vaping too then? I mean, is there uh, the difference between that? I don't know if that would be included. So if it's all in there together, right? Right. Okay. Thank well, you. except the cannabis laws did have something specifically for a lounge of effect, essentially think of it as a cannabis bar, right? So in other words, there were cannabis stores where I can sell the stuff, but there were also 
lounges where I could smoke or partake, like, again, the alcoholic equivalent of a liquor store and a bar. Right. So, so this, if their goal is to one day include cannabis in their hookah lounge, then they need to pick a spot that that will work in, or they could open up now and move a year from now. Okay. I just want them to be aware that certain, based on the location's proximity to a church, uh, that it's it wouldn't fly under the new uh, cannabis laws, and that we also are looking to restrict it to certain portions of the commercial zones. Yeah, it certainly would be interesting to ask them what they intend. Right. You know, what's, what the they, future, what they, if they, well, what, what is their definition of it? What do they smoke? And then, right. What's their decision going forward, which right. may make a decision on whether or not they open there or not. Mm -hmm. And so. it's interesting. Their hours of operation are 4 PM to 1 AM Monday through Sunday, and then Friday and Saturday, 4 PM to 2 AM. So it sounds more like it's a late night and it says they will not be selling alcohol. Or no, it doesn't sell, say alcohol, it says food. Food, it's not gonna be selling food of any any prepared. It's the food. interesting hours to me, it's late yeah. hours. Yeah, that doesn't yeah. strike me as just a smoke shop. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Um, there is a Architectural Heritage Award presentation and then three public hearings um one with regards to chapter 70 273 to limit parking in cul-de-sacs um, we may want to put that one as the third on the list because that one is likely to bring in a lot of comments okay as you've already seen um you know, as I've been answering people, they've asked, well, why such the big list? The highway department went through and determined where there are potential issues with regards to emergency vehicle access and turnaround. Um, some of those then, because of the design and the layout of the neighborhoods when they were built, driveways are not big to support visitors and such, and people do um, are, you know, feel that it would be a significant adverse impact to them to take away the on street parking in the cul de sac. You know, as I've been explaining to them, we don't know for certain which ones those do include. So when we were talking about this with the highway department, my thought was let's do the full list, send it out. And if there's ones where we think the adverse impact exceeds the benefit gained, we compare those from the list. Um, but it didn't make sense to me to do them a few at a time on a piecemeal basis. Um, as you'll notice, there is no resolution. Our plan is just to hold the public hearing because we expect there to be changes to the law. The other thing I've been asking everybody, because this is part of where some of this issue started, is the people who use that, the circle as a driveway extension whether they would have an issue with the prohibition on overnight parking. And I don't think I've gotten a single person who has an issue with that. Everybody who wants the on-street parking, they want it because guests coming over, um, you know, therapists or retailers or lawnmowers or contractors or whatever, not for overnight use. Um, so, uh, but like I said, we'll see. We've been gathering all of them that have been being sent in either to me directly or to the town clerks. They'll all be in, a, Jenny's been compiling them all into one file. Um, I've been trying to copy you guys in on the responses. Um, I didn't always do that in the early ones, especially when I was replying from my phone, um, but I've been doing that more recently. So, uh, you know, like I said, you'll see that um, there are a number of people in some of the neighborhoods where the, the houses were laid out with shorter driveways that they feel it would be a significant impact to take away the on-street parking. So we'll have to, when we go through that list, we'll have to weigh that 
again, weigh that adverse impact against the impact of safety. I will say that the highway department took the safe route. So in other words, the list, they basically went through any of them that they saw that could be a potential issue. Um, and uh, I know Tim Lessing is more than happy to explain there why one, any one of them was on the list. Um, because again, like there were a couple I had questioned and wasn't aware of, for instance, one had a crash gate as the emergency secondary emergency access to an entire other neighborhood or apartment complex. Um, it might be good to invite the fire department or representative from the fire department to uh, comment um, during the uh, um, meeting. Okay. The one who's the liaison to the fire department. I can talk to. I can call Mike. <laughs> <Thanks, Mike. laughs> yep. <laughs> Table's not even sloped that way. I'll call him tomorrow. <laughs> okay. Appreciate uh, it, Mike. Um, on those call the call to sacks that are already the, there's some call to sacks in town that you can't park on currently. How are they posted? Are there sign? Are there post? Are there signs? I don't know that answer. Okay. I just kind of curious. I was going to take it. I didn't. I it. if I had to guess, it's a mix. Some are posted. Okay. Some, you know, there are certain areas where we post the no parking signs and people rip them up. Right. I would, I would just, you know, because of, you know, when, yep. When somebody goes over there, cut the lawns and everything else, it's going to be. Now, one out. of the things to be clear, like, you know, if someone's going over there, a contractor to mow the lawn, they will often park in an area where it's not supposed to be parking. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they choose it very unwisely. And I say that because I know that on Brooks Road, they will pick just before the crest of the hill. So you're coming up, you now have to move into opposing traffic where you can't see the traffic coming the other way. And those are the times when I wish we had our uh, special attention detail where I could give them a call and say, hey, come ticket this guy. Um, there's other times where they're smart about it and they park at the bottom of the hill where you have good sight lines and that I understand because they can't, the driveways aren't sufficient to turn around with a trailer. Um, so again, you know, in any of these cases, it's not about being draconian. It's about the safety issues. And again, some of this started with the problems of people driveways spilling out into the uh, cul-de-sacs um, but there were also ones like we've talked about it for some time the, the hammerheads on in Riverton if you have to turn an emergency vehicle around you can't you have to back out onto the state highway which of course isn't safe to do so um, it's I guess it's not state highway anymore it's uh, the but Scottsville West Henry Road um, the, uh, you know, it's, it's just those end uh, hammerheads need to be kept open so that people can actually perform a K-turn. Okay, any other questions on those? We also have Riverton Parcel A. Um, this is just, again, just gonna be the special use permit hearing. We've asked them to, make a couple, we met with them today, went over a couple minor modifications. Um, and uh, there's a, our fire marshal is reviewing their plans with regards to the close proximity of some of the houses. It's 15 feet, which isn't that unusual, except that some of them are duplexes. Um, and so uh, we're, he's looking at, you know, trying to prevent fire spread from one to the next. Um, so he's taking a look at that, but uh, the plans aren't quite done yet, but we'll at least get a bunch of feedback. Um, he did go out and get the letter from a wildlife uh, consultant with regards to the Eagle. So that, that will be, if it hasn't already, will be added to the file. 
Um, they are going to update their traffic impact study. It won't be ready for Wednesday night, but they are gonna update it to include parcel E. Um, but again, it, I'm not, because of the direction the traffic turns, I, I will be shocked if parcel E affects parcel A at all um, from a traffic impact statement. But from a seeker standpoint, we wanna cross all the T's and dot all the I's. So we've asked them to, to get that. We supplied the, the parcel E uh, traffic study to the, the developers of parcel A to have them add those numbers into their calculations. Um, but again, when you look at the amount of traffic that's adding versus the amount of traffic that's already on New York 253, I just don't see it being relevant. We'll talk about it on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, we'll go. Okay. Um, as you may have seen, we had a um, resident. He's a student. Jackson is his name. He's a student in the Rush Enter Central School District. Um, he sent us a letter uh, with a request to save the bees. Becky, do you have that, the graphic he shared? Uh, not readily available, but I will look for it. This one? Yeah. That's it. Yep. Okay. Yeah, we got, we sent I, it. I'd sent it and I think it's actually part of the, it was part of the packet, I believe, but yep. it is. Um, but anyway, he, um, you know, the good news for him and he was excited to hear about it is we're doing a lot of this stuff already. Um, you know, one of the issues he had was the use of herbicides um, in, in areas that, you know, that basically the, the, the bees can carry that back and, and cause issues for the hives. Um, I find it funny because at the same time, we got complaints from residents about how there were dandelions growing in our uh, cul-de-sacs and some of the um, breezeways, but the reason is because we don't use the, the herbicides there. Um, and again, it does provide pollination sites for the bees. So um, typically we use them. So we'll use them for things like the emerald ash borer, um, potentially for the gypsy moth. But um, there's a, the gypsy moth uh, are, are on the rise again. So there's a potential infestation coming. Hmm. Um, we're gonna try and get out ahead of it. We've been working with um, an individual in town who has familiarity with it. And we've recorded a video uh, to help homeowners with some inexpensive ways and even non-herbicidal or excuse me, pesticidal ways to deal with the gypsy moth. Um, Basically, what you need to do the it's the it's the caterpillars that do all the damage. They can defoliate a tree, and then of course they hatch and fly on and defoliate the next tree. So if you can catch them at that tree and prevent the um, caterpillars from defoliating and and uh, going through metamorphosis, um, you can stop the infestation in its track. So. Um, and then the other thing was he asked that the town consider putting up beehives, which of course we do have over at Tinker. So I invited him, I put him in touch with the Tinker staff, said if he wants to go over and see them, they can show him. Um, but then I also told him that we would share his graphic here and that I will be, um, I got him to send me the high resolution background image and I'll recreate the text in the town newsletter. So it'll be part of the community portion of the town newsletter this summer so that's great i don't suppose by any chance i never heard back from jackson as to whether he wanted to be on i assume no one from the town clerk's office did either no no word for on our end either okay 
I had just given the opportunity if he wanted to speak, he could, but um, part of the problem is he was sending his emails from a student account. So what he had to do is send his emails. Fortunately, he was copying in his advisor, okay. teacher, because student accounts can't go in and out of the Rush Henrietta school system, only the teacher accounts can. Gotcha. Um, but, okay. okay. So again, thank you, Jackson, for sending that in. And um, again, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll include your graphic in the uh, August town newsletter. Um, the, uh, we did get the final supplemental generic environmental impact statement for incentive zoning and solar from Walt Kalina. Um, it is remarkably similar to the draft <laughs> supplemental GEIS and the reason being there was nobody with any comments or objections to it. So um, the closest we came were some people happy that we were putting in incentives for um, so online, when I was talking about it in my state of the town address, uh, people made comments that they were happy that we were addressing vacant buildings and encouraging people to reuse instead of uh, paving over green space. So, um, and we've also, when we did the solar arrays, there were people who were happy that we were doing the large scale solar in a manner that would not significantly impact open space um, or negatively impact farming. So all the comments that I've received so far have been positive. Um, but again, none were specifically addressed to the environmental impact statement. They were just comments in general when I was talking about the, what, what we were doing. So uh, basically what happens now at Wednesday, we'll accept the final um, the final draft. If you guys are assuming you guys are good with that, and then we will um, issue the was it notice of release notice of final completion. Final final right. So the notice of completion that has to sit for ten days, um, and then basically on, on the June 9th town board meeting. We, we, what's that? We would adopt our findings and then we would uh, call for the public hearing for the local laws. Right. To update the local laws. And again, the local laws haven't changed, although I do want to look over them one more time because there were one or two tweaks, if you remember, to the solar codes that we did when we were, it wasn't the codes, but if you remember when we did the remote Delaware River solar project, we had them, we just wrote all the conditions of the code into the approval. Mm -hmm. And so they were following it. And there were one or two things that we changed slightly because we realized, oh, this would create a, it would be much more difficult to implement it the way it was written. So I just want to make sure, I think those changes made it back to the code, the law. I want to do a double check. Um, so there may be one, but I'll have that ready for next meeting so that when we call for the public hearing, the laws can be directly attached. Okay. Uh, again, if there is a change from what's currently attached to the um, supplemental GEIS, it's minimal. Yeah, I, and I, I do wanna make some formatting changes and I'll do that. Um, but just so you know, the local laws are actually their own separate thing. The, the, we seekerize them just like we seekerize a project, but then the project itself is its own thing. So, right. no, I know case, that, but I, I wouldn't feel good if the drafts that the GEIS is talking about are totally different than what we eventually put right. in place. Yeah, they'll do they'll do what they what they do now, but I think they could use a little formatting work. So I'll make sure that right. gets done. Any question, more questions on that? Um, so we did receive notice that um, we've got approval for our grant disbursement for the new exercise slash play trail for Breeze Park. Uh, this was put in 
before I was supervisor. It disappeared for a while. We tracked it down, updated it, and we just recently received approval. So um, all the equipment's actually on a state contract. We're just gonna update the quotes, um, put that back in. You can see the drawing up on the screen. Um, but includes a number of PlayStations. We had also updated the PlayStations from the original draft. We tried to add a few more quote unquote natural elements. And I say quote unquote because they're not natural. <laughs> they're made to look natural, but they are made of a material that, um, so like the logs aren't gonna give you splinters. Yeah. Uh, the stones aren't rock hard. Um, so uh, this part of this would overlap with the river walk trail, but it then would provide a loop back to the main portion of the park. Um, it's possible there's going to be enough funding depending on what the quotes come back with. There may be enough funding to put in a um, small bathroom or a pavilion at the, I'll call it the launch point of the trail. Um, picnic area type of thing. So, um, but again, that's gonna be dependent on uh, where these quotes come back. So it's $250,000 is what we're getting from the state. Um, and then we have to match it with 110,000. And that could be um, either purchases or in kind. So in other words, the work we do, prepping the trail, that type okay. of stuff, that would all count. So would something like this fall in the purview of the money that we're getting for the state that we could use if we needed to use those monies? Something that could be for the benefit of the whole town, this kind of park and stuff? I'm talking about plan. the COVID money, the stimulus money. That came this is separate from the, the stimulus money. This is this is uh, state aid to municipalities through DASNY. I understand that part of it, but if we needed to spend money, could we spend that money if we come in? It can only be spent for this purpose. No, the American Rescue Plan money, he's can we use part of that towards this? He's referring to the, I think you're referring Why to Why do you think we need to? The other 110,000. If we needed 000. to. Uh, not that I'm aware of. None, okay. This wouldn't be considered infrastructure under, that was specifically for water and sewer Water, sewer, and uh, broadband. Broadband. Okay. All right. This Sorry, is I missed. I was hearing no your question the other direction. The photos of what's coming in that we could use it for look great. Yep. The diagram and everything looks great. <clears throat> I just think uh, this is a that uh, Mike Candelo spent a lot of time on this project. Mike Candelo? <clears throat> yeah, he did. Oh. Candelo, yep. Yeah, this was this started with Mike, and then, like I said, in 2018, um, we tracked it down, and I worked with Jason and Mike to update it, picking different, some different elements. Right. Um, and then we got that updated, and we just received the approval. So, I think it'll be a great addition to the. Um... Breeze Park, I, think, I really think there's something uh, a little bit more need, was needed over there and th this will be a really nice addition. Um, also on the agenda is the seeker determination for East River Road as well as their mixed use application and multifamily um, application. Make sure you check out the new plans. They were able to come to an arrangement with the home, the property owner at the top of the hill. So if you recall, part of the delay in this was we didn't feel that it was safe to have trucks making the left turn out of the Southern entrance. Um, and the uh, they were able to work out a deal. So the Northern entrance would be at the crest of the hill where there would be good sight lines in both directions. So it would be safe for the trucks to turn out. They changed the plan slightly, um, shifted things around accordingly. Um, 
one of the things I was adamant about was that the, uh, I'll call it the industrial access road that runs right along the northern boundary. I wanted it outside the parking lots. Originally they had parking lots to either side, but what I didn't want having happen is somebody who was coming to the apartments to have to cross that industrial road to get to their apartments. Gotcha. So we moved it such that the road is on the outside of the, apart the parking lots, the parking lots are all inside of it. So there'll be no crossing. That also provides them the potential benefit if, um, the property to the north, the Wallman property, the Wallman family has been talking about doing something there for quite some time, including with an industrial component. And so to have, to they, they'd be able to work out potentially a cost share arrangement so that uh, Wallman property would only add a single entrance on the um, East River Road and they would share that industrial road um, because the driveways could just go immediately to the north. And then hopefully what would happen is they'd be able to work out an arrangement with the um, property to the east, paychecks, where they exit out onto John Street so that this future industrial property, the vehicle, the industrial traffic is more likely to come in off of uh, John Street than in off of uh, East River Road. So. But again, that part we don't have to decide now. Um, this particular, from a standalone standpoint, one of the things we've talked about is that we would have them include signage in a restriction that there was no semi or large truck access out through the southern entrance because we don't want trucks going there and turning left. They'd have to go out through the northern entrance. Um, We've also talked about them where the trail has to, the um, river walk trail has to come in through their property. They're using that as part of their um, civic requirement. So we've asked them to commit to, build, to building it per town specs mm -hmm. instead of the town building it. Since again, they're using it as part of their requirement to meet the civic space, which I'm okay with. And we did right. the same thing with the Lehigh mixed use to the South. Right. So, um, but then what that will potentially allow us to do is uh, focus our funds up north and potentially light the trail, um, especially because in Craig and I were talking with representatives from our G&E and they would be willing to put money towards this to help light it. Oh, that's great. So um, we think by the focusing of the town funds um, and the additional contribution from our g &E that we'll be able to light the trail. I don't want to light it up like a Christmas tree, but I don't want it to be dark either. I'm sorry? Whether it's just, I, we might even be able to get all the way down here depending on, well, certainly we would do Bailey North. And then, like I said, I'd look at coming uh, south, at least certainly to, um, I gotta believe we can get to Lucius Gordon Drive. But. So is this a third project that has fallen under that mixed use development or second? It is the third if you count. So the, the yeah, other Lehigh. two, Lehigh and Marketplace Mall. Marketplace. Mm -hmm. So has any of them, um, you know, well, obviously Marketplace has it with their, with their uh, in, where they have some jobs available. But uh, is there, so there is no time frame for them to add the, uh, the not industrial a, or the- portion. Not a hard time frame, um, but they do have to hold it um, in a natural state until such a time as they come forth to, to develop it. Okay, I'd like to, well. And again, look at look at closing a loophole. So they they have sooner or later. Again, they have to I don't it. consider it a loophole when we you had know, those meetings. Know, yeah, I know. Right. It, at the meetings. Yeah, I took we it. We talked as, about right. We we no, but <laughs> this topic specifically came up. Yes. And again, there's a lot of people who would love it if it never came in and stayed green the entire time. So again, I don't see it as a loophole. Well, the, if you're the, looking the, at it, that the intent, the intent was to have civic 
residential and and live in working areas. And if you're just putting in two of the three, it, there's a loophole that you don't have to put the. It's not a loophole if we expressly allow it. Is my point. Stop okay. using the term loophole. So the thing is, there are already. It wasn't the intent. It was my intent. Absolutely. Okay. It was. I would be happy for them to never build the industrial, and that it stays green. So the other way to look at it is this is similar to stuff like the conservation cluster, where in order to develop that land, they have to preserve a bunch of other land. Right. So again, if you go back to the old um, multifamily that used to be allowed in industrial, they could have developed this entire parcel as multifamily, full density, no civic space requirement, much less green space, and no industrial and or open space. So from an intent standpoint, part of the thing was we were trying to reduce the amount of um, how much of the industrial land that these projects took over. And when you look at the two large industrial areas that those can either be industrial or empty, it was successful. Now, again, there's a lot of people, and I guarantee you every single one of the adjacent neighbors on Lehigh Station Road who would much prefer that they never get developed. Um, but the point is, it either gets developed as industrial or nothing. So to me, that has met the intent of what that the purpose of that change was. Um, it wasn't to say we can't have any uh, multifamily in our town. It wasn't to put undue restrictions on multifamily. It was to put it was part of it was the preservation of industrial space um, and commercial space because too much of it was getting taken over by multifamily. And we were ending up with multifamily in portions of the town that really couldn't support it. That was the true intent. Um, and, and again, we've accomplished that. The other benefits when you go to the marketplace, mixed use was again, that was a revitalization area. And that senior housing is absolutely going to help revitalize that tired retail area. So in this case, it was providing apartments. This is the employment area in conjunction with businesses. Well, there are a ton of businesses there. So the idea that somehow if they don't build that one small uh, industrial space, that there are no nearby adjacent places for these people to work is not true. And again, part of that was, that goes back to why we have this trail system is so that people can get from where they live to where they work without even ever having to go on the road if they so choose. So from an intent standpoint, this meets the intent. I know you seem to have this need that it has to be built at a particular time frame and such. But again, as one of the people on that committee that was never my intent in fact i was arguing the the other side of it i was one, arguing the side the i was just arguing and one of the intent was to have a place where you could uh work live and play kind of thing. and uh, and you and, can here there are 30 some odd businesses all within close proximity to this apartment so i think maybe mike it was supposed Stafford's, to be on the uh, same complex on the same land so are you saying, Mike, and just the way I take it, you just want to look at it as if they develop that industrial, there'll be more jobs there and closer to that particular housing development. Yeah, when we were going when we were talking about the mixed use development, that was right. one of the one of the reasons we wanted to do it. So you could have a mm -hmm. uh, a place, you know, live close to your work right. area. Right. And that was well, it doesn't mean it won't happen, but right. I understand that you want right. that done for the jobs. Would like us some kind of time frame. Yep. Thank you. So we're on the same accord. Yep. We're all in the same same accord with that. <clears throat> okay. Um, so that's six, seven, and eight. Uh, 
for number nine, we haven't received anything from Dunwood. That's supposed to be Dunwood Green, not Dunwood Good. <laughs> they get a um, traffic light, it'll be done good. That's right. <laughs> so, can I ask, I got a question. So, so we will not be considering authorizing me to send the letter. Okay. Uh, well, that's up to you, unless you're willing to sign it carte blanche, but you haven't seen what they're asking, so. Well, if you recall, I, um, I was concerned with this back when we approved it, when that, I should say we approved it, when that project was approved. Uh, who, um, who is asking for that Dunwood Green light? Dunwood Green is approaching the New York State DOT to try to get them to put in a light. Again, ultimately, the light decision is up to New York State DOT, not us. Right, and that's and so they're asking, would you support our effort? Okay. And I said, sure, but I'm not going to write a letter of support until I see the letter of you know the right. details about what you're asking. Right. Okay. And they weren't able to get it to me before uh, noon today, so okay. we basically, I told Jenny, leave it on tonight's. We'll just discuss it, but it won't be part of Wednesday's agenda because okay. we don't have it. And the developer would be paying for that light, correct? Yeah. Okay. And then because I saw Edgewood Avenue or Dunwood. Green. Well, so I'm also good at because I've asked them the question. If there was a light at Edgewood, so let's say that their apartment entrance didn't merit it from. A, well, I don't think actually either of them by the New York State standards merit it, but let's say that Edgewood was closer than Dunwood Green. I've asked the folks at Dunwood, do they think a light at Edgewood would help open up gaps at Dunwood? Um, I didn't get an answer back in time, okay. um, but that's why it says or, because um, the point is somewhere a light between Winton and Clover, or not Clover, uh, YMCA. Toby, Toby Village, yeah, the YMCA. Right. That um, was my concern back, whatever it was, a year and a half ago. No, I understand. And again, it's, it's never stopped being our concern. The problem is we don't have any authority over it. So I didn't think this would be an issue, but nope. I also, I don't, I, I'm willing to sign a letter that is me as town supervisor, but if I'm signing a letter for the town, it needs to be town board action, not my action. So um, that's why this was on the agenda, but then like I said, they didn't get me the details in time. So okay. it'll be on for June 9th. Um, same thing, this one, I do have the letter. This is the light at Authors Avenue. So the more we were talking about this with respect to the, um, it, this largely came up because of the proposed development uh, that extends Nevins and Authors. Right. Um, I think it's necessary, irrespective of whether that project gets approved. I do think that if that project does get approved, it does, add to the warrant level but um i just think right now because of the school bus traffic um and the number of vehicles carrying elementary school kids in and out trying to make a left onto that onto lehigh station road that a light should go in there um you know i hear this thing about that it doesn't warrant it and we heard this, what I think is a not a sufficient excuse is that um, uh, if they put in a traffic light where there isn't uh, enough cross traffic that it increases the chance of rear end collisions. Uh, I find that hard to believe. Maybe if it was a light where it didn't have good visibility from a long ways away if people are pay, not paying that much attention, then I certainly wouldn't want it coming in and out of my, uh, where my um, school kids are coming. And I'd rather have them rear end somebody sitting at a, uh, waiting for a school bus to turn than have them collide with the school bus itself. So mm -hmm. um, I reached out to the school district to make sure they were okay with me sending the letter. They were in full support of that as well. Um, I was contemplating having them sign on to this one. I may suggest that they write a similar letter. Um, and that way we 
and my plan, if you'll notice, is to send that also uh, with a cover letter, send a carbon copy to Senator Gallivan and Assembly Member Bronson saying we really need your help to force the state DOT to put in this light. Uh, the thing that kills me, they have one at um, Roth. I find it hard to believe that the traffic out of there is heavier than the traffic coming out of authors, <clears throat> especially since, yeah, so maybe the school itself is a little bit bigger, but you've also got all of the traffic off of authors and all the side streets off of authors coming out that way too. And in the other direction, you've got all the houses off of Green Clover. Now granted across from Roth is another neighborhood, but um, having- It is they, busy there. Right. Yeah, so get more access to the light from people coming out of the restaurant. Because Mert Mertensia, which is that road down in there, there's not a lot of houses. Across from Roth, yeah. Right. Fireside probably <laughs> creates more traffic, people coming out there. Yeah, so like I said, I just look at, and same, you know, my road, I just, there's a decent number of cars that come out, but it's not like it's heavy traffic. I, you know, and that's got a light and yeah. there's just so many of them that I can bring up as examples of where there are lights without heavy cross traffic. Right. Yeah. But the other thing is if it's going on that argument, if it's got the, um, the loops in, then if there's no cross traffic, it's not going to change. It'll only, if only change if someone crosses the induction loop. And again, that's how, that's how Brooks Road is. So, um, interesting enough, the, uh, the development that the city put in for Costco, they didn't have a light, um, on one of the exits and you couldn't make a left. Couldn't make a back left. On the extreme, they just put a light up there. Yep. So I guess sometimes things change and they see fit that they got to put a light up. Yeah. yeah, that was when you were going out of the Costco, that was very difficult when you were going out at the light because you know, you'd hit anybody turning south would have to hit, you know, if you were at the back of the line, you'd hit two or three times. Right. Oh, yeah. it's awful getting out yep. of yep. 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 So now, you'd like, just like you say, they, they put an additional. But um, I know coming out of Sherman, like when my kids went to Sherman, you could wait a while there. Mm -hmm. So if it was like especially for the off, school buses, yeah. Do we know what, what the numbers. status of the development that's um, been being talked about is? Um, we've others? got a meeting with them later this week to get the updates on the alternate entrances that they've been looking at. Okay. My understanding is it's not been good that they're they've been having trouble finding alternate entrances, but okay. um, so at some point the they'll probably update things and come back. But the idea, if we do get approval for this, if that development does go in, they'd be the ones who pay for it to put the light in. Otherwise, if we turn down the development, I would look at us putting the light in if, if the state's not willing to do it. But um, I, it, if that's part of their issue because they don't have funding, I've basically said, we'll, we'll get the developer to pay for it um, or something. We'll figure out some way to pay for it because to me that shouldn't be the, the issue. Any other questions on that? So on the rental registry relief, <clears throat> we've had some discussion. There's been, uh, I think to date only one, I suspect there may be a few others who asked for relief from the rental registry payment. The renewal is due and they haven't been able to rent the last year due to COVID. Um, we had talked about a couple different options. We were trying to minimize the impact on the staff. And my thought is this, that what we would do is we would, and this would be on the agenda, if you guys like this approach, we'd put it on the agenda for the next meeting, that basically we would authorize that if somebody was unable to rent out their apartment or house or whatever, and or unable to collect rent because of the pandemic, that they could bring some evidence of that to us. Um, 
and submit it to us. And like we used to do with the special use permits, we would essentially credit them one year of the rental registry fee for their next renewal. We had talked about extending the next renewal for a year, but that doesn't offer them any financial relief now. That offers them financial year, relief four years from now, which kind of it, is counter to the point. The person was looking for relief now. Um, the other option we have, rather than reducing the um, payment by a third, would be to extend their current renewal by one year. Have the bills already gone out for that? It's based off of their anniversary date. Oh. What is the, because I'm I sorry, thought when it, you said it, what is the fee that they pay? Yeah. Kevin, what's the fee they pay? Twenty five. It's it's one hundred and fifty dollars for every three years, so it's fifty bucks a year. Fifty bucks a year, right? Okay. So it's it's not. Is it per unit or per? It's one and two family homes. We charge them the one hundred and fifty. Okay. So if I understood you right, Steve, if they paid already, we'll give them a credit for the next year. For the next payment, okay. right. Everybody's paid already. Okay. The issue is it's for the people who are coming up for renewal. He, he's like, well, I paid for three years, but I only got to use two. Oh, I got So you. we can either extend it another year, de uh, delay when they have to make their next payment, or he would have to pay 100 instead of 150. I don't know which one you guys prefer. Gotcha. We either delay the 150 for a year or we reduce 150 to 100. And you're going to do, are you thinking of doing that across the board? No, we don't want to do it across the board. They're going to provide documentation. Again, if you look at the way we used to do the um, special use permit, no, you guys weren't around when this happened, but they used to come to the town board. It would be at workshop we would read the case and we would basically just take an up down vote as to whether we would approve it or not. Um, and usually we would err on extending. So it would be something similar. We would basically, I'm thinking it makes more sense as I talked about it here that rather than give them the credit that we just extend the current one by one year because that then just pushes off, it pushes off their payment of 150 till the following year. Would that also be easiest administratively? It really, go ahead. I think, I, I think if we, well, if they come up for renewal now and we give them three years for a hundred bucks is easier on our, on my staff. Because now, now we'd have to call them again in a year just to come in and pay the 150. Okay, gotcha. And then we're only talking a handful of them anyway, so. Yeah, I, I'll be shocked if we're talking Double digits. I got a book okay. right now. Like I said, it's been one. Okay. How many? Of the, how many of these pit permits are? It's not permits. It's or, rental registries. Rent, rental registries. I'm sorry. How many are? Uh, how many are out there? Every. Yeah. You know, uh, I don't. I don't have that number. I'd have to. It's it's a size look of number. Um, because of gentlemen like Mr. Spahn, who has a bunch of. <laughs> Houses in the well. There's also yeah. the one that uh, the Tomasino or however you say his name, who's the one who has all all the homes that originally were going to be for sale, and he's been renting them instead. Right. Tommy Thomas. Yeah. Um, so those ones are all on. I think my name was from uh, the movie. Um, I think about it. <laughs> Uh, the um, so there's a couple people with a whole lot of houses, right. but um, there's you know like I've got one. I rent my old house to my uh, cousin's kids. Yeah, I had to register it on the rental registry. Have people ask me all the time about rentals in Henrietta? They're very hard to find. Yeah. Okay. I would say do do it whatever. You know the easiest way administratively, uh, I would say. Okay. You know, and and have them obviously sign something that they right. You know, hardship. Okay, I'll put that together for the next meeting. 
So what, I'm sorry, which, which way, which option are you choosing? That they would come in, present, and essentially would give them a $50 credit for their renewal. Present so, to our whole board or to? Yes, to the board at workshop, they would just basically, they're not gonna present, they're gonna submit. They're gonna submit, just like with the renewal, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll create a little form that they can basically, I am requesting an extension. There'll be two reasons or I'm a credit or whatever, it'll either be because I was unable to rent uh, during COVID or because I was unable to collect rent during COVID. So um, basically all last year, they weren't allowed to evict anybody who was not paying rent. Um, and that's still going on now. Yep. Um, so, you know, um, it's, it is sunsetting, but you're probably going to find a bunch of people who just move out rather than pay all their back rent. So there's going to be a number of, you know, landlords adversely affected because of this, but um, how many of them are willing to go through the hassle to, to save $50? I don't know. Steve, does it require them to actually come to our board though? I mean, if they check it off and sign it, do you think they should have to come before our board for that? Did we uh, we never did that for the extensions. I think it's just going to it's just going to yeah, office, I think right? if they sign it, then we don't want to investigate it for fifty bucks. I understand, yeah. but I also want that decision to be on the board to make the up down decision instead of Kevin's people having to make that decision. So they'll fill it out, they'll sign the thing, and we'll make the decision. And again, unless it's something ridiculous, we're uh, I'm not. I'm not looking to investigate thoroughly. I just want someone to attest to the fact that they were harmed. Okay. I don't know. If, I think there's some talk yet about uh, some monies coming from the government to help these landlords that were and, that right. were affected. So sure. Yep. Okay. Again, this we're not talking about a, a whole lot here. Um, so number 12, um, one of the things we're looking at is, as we had the discussion, what do we do for these off site dealership storage lots? We had talked about the potential for some, I'll refer to them more hidden locations. Um, I've actually had two developers come forward with a couple of potential locations. Um, and I've told them, okay, I'll, I'll um, let's start drawing those up and show what that looks like. Um, but you know, let's try to define the code by which that's allowed. Um, and this is, you know, one of the things that we same. Some of the things you saw in there are conditions that we put on the temporary one, right? That there's no nobody's being adversely affected by it. Um, the, the one thing that is in this new one that wasn't in the presence of that temporary one is that it was in, in, a, in a location screen from a major road. I think it's actually any public road because I wouldn't want it off of residential street either. So I think it's off of any public road. So I'll give you a couple of the ideas. One of them was um, Brighton Henry at a town line road. There's a industrial lot that's kind of a flag lot. There's two buildings up front and a driveway going back to this other parcel they're eventually developing it out to be a business but they're going to be doing that development in phases and their thought was that to offset while they're doing it they would rent that space out because um, they're going to fence the whole property in it's the um it's one of the um landscaping companies they're moving here from one of the um like Spencer Ford or further out west Clarkson. than that. Clarkson. I think it was Clarkson. Yeah, it was somewhere out west. Um, but uh, so they're eventually they're going to develop the whole lot. But in the short term, when they first put in their their initial garage that they're going to use for their stuff, the future site buildings they were looking to locate that off. Um, another one was um, one of the 
parking lots in the Delphi complex off again around and tucked in behind um, where you wouldn't see it. Um, the developer even offered that he'd put up berms to close it off. One of the key things with any of these locations, there would be no customer access and there would be no sales activity. Um, it is just purely for the storage of the, the new vehicles themselves. Um, so those are the two that have come to me. Um, would this include things like, I don't know, um, Amazon trucks? No, this was specifically dealership. offsite dealership storage. Okay. It would not include Amazon trucks. Now, if we wanted to, the issue that I have with the Amazon trucks is every single day they're in right, and out. They're busy, lot. in and out. Whereas the new cars, they're not. It's not in and out. It's storage. Okay. Uh, they would come to that lot. They'd get put on the lot once and they'd get taken off the lot once. Whereas the Amazon trucks, it's every single day. So this, as it's currently written, is for, and right now it doesn't even include used cars. Okay. It's new cars only. New cars only. It's whatever. Okay. Yeah. So again, if people want to change that, let me know. But I, I, my understanding was we didn't want to change it. What I also included in there is the way the, I hate the way the car dealerships are help, dealt with today. They are not on the allowed use anywhere. Um, but they're also not in a number of places. They aren't on the, not, or the prohibited use list either. Um, in the commercial B1 zone, they are on the prohibited list, but then there's an accept for, and they give the, the stretch. So what I propose we rewrite that is we put them on the allowed list for commercial B1, but only with that restriction that they have to be within that area. And then on the prohibited list, it says car dealerships except for were expressly allowed in the one above. And again, like before, it still requires a special use permit. In B2, it would expressly uh, outlaw car dealerships. We already did that when we were updating industrial for something else, we put it in an industrial that is expressly prohibits it in industrial. So I just wanna finish up cleaning up the commercial one um, to cover that. Any other questions on that? So again, um, I gave, I attached to this one, um, you'll see it's not the local law, it's the changes to the code. And then we would just, again, convert that to a local law, but it basically goes through what the actual changes are. Make sure you're good with that, look through that. Um, we have to have the local law out uh, one week from Wednesday. Steve, did you circulate this? I did. Okay. I'm sure I saw that, but. If you don't see it, uh, are you on the town? Usually whenever I type town board, I follow it up with Don, but I. Yeah, I usually do. If not, I I'll forward it to make sure you got it. Okay. Um, okay. Go ahead. We approved that one last week. Oh, I see it here. It's here. Okay. Uh, we approved that one last week. I noticed that all the all the forty seven cars there are used cars. Currently, I'm not sure if they just didn't get rid of them yet or what the story is. Yeah, I don't know. You, the, how do you know they're used cars out of curiosity? Hmm? How do you because know they're they, used cars? They have uh, old registered they're older vehicles. They're used. You can tell they're used vehicles. And, gotcha. And there's even some of them even have the. Uh, old registration stickers on them and some have stickers on the windshield. This car is not for resale at this time or something like that. None of them have the sticker on the window either for new vehicles. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, if you remember, they'd been actually doing it right. without permission yeah. for lack of a better way to yeah, put it. Yeah, they probably just haven't gotten cleaned up. Right. Yet. That's correct. Uh, We've been talking for some time over driveways, updating the driveway code. There have been a number of go, go rounds. I put in the last changes based off of feedback from the um, 
the numerous players in this, including the Zoning Board of Appeals and the uh, building, you know, basically code enforcement, Kevin's building and fire prevention division. Um, our goals here are, you know, there's a number of these driveways that changes or variances that people come in and they're almost always approved. Um, if not always approved. I, uh, I just throw the almost in front because I don't know if there was ever a time when one of them was turned down. But, um, and so our thought is let's, if that's what we're always getting the variance for, let's just make that part of the town code to reduce the number of variances. Um, in addition, there were some inconsistencies or the way the code was written, you needed, you know, three variances for the same thing. So for instance, the driveway, it was seven feet from the property line. Driveway extensions was five feet from the property line. Uh, if I was doing a driveway extension and it was going off to the left, it might, because the driveway maximum width was 20 feet, um, if I had a, you know, 12 foot wide garage and I'm putting a 10 foot wide extension on there, I'm now 22 feet. So I had to get, just to put that extension in, I had to get a variance for the width. I had to get a variance for the seven foot setback. And then I had to get a variance for the five foot setback potentially, depending on how close I was to the property line. So one of the things we did is we settled at all portions of the driveway, it's five feet instead of seven. And that way, if they're doing something along those lines, they just have to get a variance for that five foot setback. Okay. We don't repeat the five foot setback everywhere. It makes it clear this is for all parts of the driveway. Um, we also added in the stuff for the turnaround. So one of the problems with the turnaround is if you wanted to put a turnaround in your driveway because you live on a busy road and it's dangerous to back out or back in, the only way to do that was to get a variance for width. Well, once you have that variance for width, so for instance, we did this at my uh, father-in-law's house, we've got a variance for 40 feet wide. We could make a 40 foot wide driveway up and down, um, which obviously wasn't the intent for what that was for, it was to put in a turnaround. So instead we defined a turnaround, how it could be done. We put it in only for town or for county and state roads. And the reason we did that is that is the predominance of our major roads where you need that turnaround for it not to be dangerous. Um, we figured that there are some, there are a few town roads where that might apply, um, but our, the ability to define those in code would have been tough or we would have had to list them we figured it's easier to handle the town roads by variance. So basically what we will allow is somebody can get the variance on the, they could basically, it would allow them to do that uh, turnaround, even though they're not on a state or county road. Um, one of the things for both the driveway extensions and the turnarounds, we make clear it is not for normal use parking because we don't want to see these turn into giant parking lots. Uh, somebody asked me, what if somebody wants to park on it, would they have to get a variance? I said, yes, because essentially it would no longer be a turnaround. Right. It would be a widening of the driveway. Okay. So um, we put all that stuff in. We also dealt with, some of the language about the extensions being alongside the garage. What does it mean to be near to? We basically instead made it hard, cold. The far edge can't be more than 12 feet from the edge of the, the physical edge of the garage. And we went with that because um, some people want to put a planter in between the extension and the garage. The problem they had as well, if we because we originally were going to talk about you could have it up to two feet away and it could be a maximum of 10 feet. And as someone who's had a wide boat trailer before, I'll tell you that 10 foot is sometimes tough to back the boat into. Mm -hmm. So we said, well, what if we made it 12 feet? And then we made the decision, well, if they want, if they want to put a planter in, it essentially reduces their maximum width. 
um, because the fear always was you give them the right to put a planter in, they pay, they put in the extension, and then a year later they remove the planter and throw a stone down, and now they've got it over with by just setting it the maximum it takes care of that. So we think we've crossed off most of the stuff. The one thing I will note that's an important distinction that we made in here is that within the right of way, that this is all for stuff beyond the right of way. Within the right of way, um, you not only have to live up to the zoning code, so if you wanna go wider, you would have to get both a variance and permission from the superintendent of highways or whomever owns that jurisdiction. So, you know, again, on a county road or a state road, we have no authority to say you can put in a 50 foot wide driveway. Right. That's up to the state. Um, so we have a maximum that we allow, but if, the, if we say they can go up to 50 feet and the state says you can put in one that's 45, it's 45. Um, and it's the same thing on the town roads. Within the right of way, um, because when you allow that extra width within the right of way, the problem is whenever we're doing work on there, that's extra cost to us from a restoration standpoint, from a gutter and, and drainage standpoint, there's a whole lot of uh, additional work that puts on the burden. And so that's up to the um, superintendent of highways, but um, beyond that, edge of the right of way, it's now, it then becomes purely a zoning issue. Okay. Uh, the other thing we make clear is that all work needs a, um, any work that is modifying the driveway requires a highway permit. Um, one of the things we did is we allow them to apply them either at the DPW or at uh, the building office because that's where they typically go for most permits it will immediately get sent down to the superintendent of highway, but this way, especially also like during the pandemic, we closed public access to the DP. Right. So, um, and then the last thing is per something we talked about previously um, that we were gonna allow stone to be a permissible use for driveways within a, on a historic property or within the rural residential district. So that it, it addresses that too. However, I will note if you have a stone driveway, the area within the right of way has to be paved. And the reason for that is we don't want stones to be constantly being carried out into the main road. Um, so that's the gist of most of the changes. Um, oh, there was one other thing we added. The other use of an extension that you see is people have, let's say a barn or a large shed and they want a road to it. And ex a driveway extension to it. And so we have two types of driveway extensions. One is the one that's extends and runs parallel to the garage. And that's typically for storage of a camper, boat, trail, or something like that. The other one is a path down to an auxiliary structure. And so it covers both of those. So hopefully this will um, reduce the number of variances, which helps both the residents from a cost standpoint, as well as it helps the zoning board of appeals. Um, so, um, look it over. If you see any issues, let us know. But again, we're going to be calling for the public hearing. How any far questions on that? Yeah. How far does the turnaround have to be from the property line? Is that five feet also? Uh, five feet from the edge side lot. It's, I don't remember how far it is from the edge of the right of way. Okay. Um, it's, it's, and then there's a certain distance from the structure itself. Okay. Thank you. But, but all the side, all portions of the driveway, it's a side, there's a side lot. For the turnaround, it also can't comprise more than a particular percentage. Actually, the, drive, the driveway as a whole can't occupy more than a particular percentage of the yard frontage. We don't want front yards disappearing into asphalt. But just so they understand, they can't use it for a parking spot. Correct. Now, again, what we talk about is regular parking. So if I've got company over right. visiting, yes. The exception. Right. right. They can park there. It's regular parking that it's not supposed to be used for. Yeah, it does streamline a lot of stuff. What's that? It streamlines a lot. Yep. Doing that. Um, for 14, uh, 
I don't think you'll find a, the finished resolution, or they might, but I, based on the feedback we've been getting for 273, we're not going to be voting on the cul-de-sac law at, at Wednesday's meeting. So uh, we'll take all the um, public hearing, get all the feedback, and then most likely uh, amend the proposed local law, put it back out uh, for the following meeting. So uh, like I said, I don't even think the resolution is attached. If it was, Don got busy. Um, but I, I had basically said something out, don't, don't bother to Jenny. We're not, we're not gonna act on this one at this meeting. Okay. Um, mask mandate. So as you know, uh, the CDC changes guidance, the state changed its rules. Um, and in typical state fashion, unfortunately, they gave us two days to act. Um, so fortunately, we've got a phenomenal sign shop here. They cranked everything out that we basically made the decision uh, the first day, sent out the stuff that night. And before opening at nine o'clock the next day, uh, we had the signs in place. So you've seen them coming in. It's basically that I have to have a vaccine or a mask. Um, for short-term visits, it's on the honor system. Uh, for long-term visits or what I'll call high intensity, so things like um, at the recreation center, if I'm in a recreation program, we are requiring proof. Uh, one of the things we are doing is we give the, them the option if they want, we can mark their account as no mask required. We don't record that they actually, anything about the proof or whatever they shared us, we just mark it that they, they don't require a mask. So whenever they check in, it'll pop up. They won't have to keep showing their proof in subsequent uh, appearances. Um, the two places where we have kept the mask requirements in place, um, children activities because children aren't vaccinated and senior activities because seniors are more vulnerable. Um, but otherwise, you know, if the uh, people there are all vaccinated, the masks come off. Um, the one other thing we've had is employees uh, dealing with the public have to continue wearing masks, especially since for the short term visits, it's on the honor system. We don't know that everybody who's coming in and without a mask truly has been vaccinated. So we're not, we don't want to put our um, employees at risk. We don't want to put those residents at risk, even though they're making the choice not to wear one when they should. But um, good news is we have a very high uh vaccination rate in town hall um we've got a good one at the library less so at dpw although i think people are starting to come around um the uh i think that covers it i don't know does anybody have any questions oh i should mention at the library they're doing something similar they're under their own they come under under education law so there's the masks up on the screen. They come under education law instead of town law. Um, but what they're doing is something similar. Um, in the children's library, they are requiring masks on at all times. Again, because children tend to, I won't, not tend. If you're under 12, you can't be vaccinated right now. So um, the one thing that they are doing differently than we are in our work areas, if everybody's vaccinated, we're allowing people to meet and congregate and talk without masks on. Um, if, but we do allow some departments are more comfortable where the people do have to wear masks when they move about. Um, the library has decided that they're requiring all their employees to continue to wear masks. Again, if they decide to change it, that's, that's up to their board, not us. Any other questions on that? We have been working with them though to try to keep it consistent across town. So from the from the resident standpoint, it's consistent. Um, the only complaint I've heard so far is a parent 
who is vaccinated got the permission to not wear the mask when they're doing their parental activities, but we made them put a mask on when they were down in with the grade school gym, gymnasts. Okay. And they were upset. They're like, I'm vaccinated. I'm like, I know, but they're not. So you need to wear the mask when you're in with them. So any other questions on that? Nope. Um, 16, 17, and 18 um, are for going, taking the traffic signals. Um, two of them would go to be converted to LED. The number 18, those two are already converted to LED, but we never updated our uh, intermunicipal agreement. So, um, Chris, I didn't see an answer um, from a budgetary standpoint. Did we have a budget from which the, the expenditure can come? Well, we've painted every five years. So basically, we have the three signals um, that we pay every five years. In fact, there's probably more than that, but these are the three that are up right now. So um, I've, it's probably out of the highway budget of some sort, but that I don't have an answer for. What am I uh, the amount is, excuse me, the amount is $850 per signal uh, for the maintenance fee, and then to convert the two over to LEDs, which is the town hall and the Veterans Memorial Park, that's a one flat fee of $1,500. And the payback for that, Steve, would be about two and a half years because we'd be saving that much electricity. Right, so I was asking specifically about the three grand. I know the 850 is in, in the budget. I just, right. So my only comment- I think Linda can find a, a spot someplace for it. Yeah, just make sure we have that answer by Wednesday, if you would. Get with I'll have to talk to Lynn on it because um, that's it's usually a highway issue. It's not an engineering issue, so it's going to have to come out of one of those budgets, I would imagine. I would agree. My point is just since you're the one putting forth the resolution, just reach out to Tim, Chuck, and Linda and copy me in on it. Just figure out where that's coming from. That the fifteen, right. the eight fifty. I think we already know the answer, and it might be the same location. I just. I will talk to Ms. Linda. Thank you. Any questions on that? For number 19, we have a resident who wants to run a, um, they're essentially going to put in their own little uh, grinder pump um, and connect to the, basically run a line to connect to the nearest um, sewer point. We would sign an out of district sewer contract. One of the things I'll note that there will be a stretch of this that will run through the uh, town's right of way. Um, what we're going to do in that regards, they would be responsible for any work, any repairs, anything along those lines, maintenance on it. The only thing we would be responsible for is if somebody comes in and does a no before you go, a call for dig we'd be the one who would flag it so as because it's their the, the owners of it will never get that notice because it'll come to us because it's not their property so because of that we're requiring that they put a tracing wire in the entire length so that it'll be easy for us to trace it and mark it so um that's the only if you will unusual thing about this that i'm aware of chris was there anything else I think it covered it pretty well, Steve. Um, you know, unfortunately, this has been a couple. They're on septic. The septic is failing. They have a young family now, so they'd really like to get hooked up to um, town sewer. And the only way to do that is to pump it. Right. So they're paying to put that connection in, and obviously they pay sewer rent. Once. Yes. That's correct. So, so this is someone who's connecting to the sewer main on Castle Road. Is that what we're looking at? Correct. Okay. The home that's set way back in. Uh, that I couldn't drive. I didn't. I didn't do it. I didn't drive by this. Um. So number twenty, the uh, medium duty 
plow truck uh, was successful in our use for it within the um, some of the hammerheads and cul-de-sacs, uh, which then freed up one of the big trucks to then be on the road. We'd originally called for getting two of them. Uh, last year, we decided to reduce that to one for two reasons. One was to make sure it did work. And the second reason is to reduce expenditures during COVID. So we're doing the purchase this year. Um, the one change Tim explained is that uh, the dump body is going to be slightly different. It's going to have drop gate sides so that it can be used by the, it can be multi used in the summertime by the parks and uh, facilities group. If I got anything wrong there, Tim, feel free to unmute and correct me. Any questions? No. Go ahead. no, Steve, you covered that fine. Um, that landscape dump that's going to be on the back, we're going to be able to use it for a, a bunch more things because you can drop the sides. We'll be able to load buckets and equipment on it, and we can also trailer equipment with it, in which case you can bring the attachments right in the back of the dump body. All okay. right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Happy to see it's coming from local dealer. Yeah, him and Chuck try to do that wherever possible. Um, for 21, we've got uh, 1063 uh, designating it as a, a historic site. Uh, the owner is, I believe, our newest member to the um, historic site committee. Yes. And uh, so he is um, designating his Greek revival uh, style farmhouse. I know that because I read the letter. <laughs> I'd originally called it a wood framed farmhouse and then got the real term. So. <laughs> Any questions on that? So again, we'd be calling for the public hearing. It's gonna be a lot of public hearings on the night. Um, Adrian has some, has a surplus item. And then she, I don't know if there's any questions on that, but she was also going to discuss the appointment of Brandon West as a library board of trustees. John, Adrian? No, she's not here. It's Jen. Oh, it's Jen. Okay. Yes, oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure what she wanted to discuss. I think it was just there was some question about so, and one we did have that discussion on there offline that so. As I mentioned, libraries are covered under education law, not under town law. Um, the town board, basically, when they they send us the recommendations as to who is going on their trustees, and they do have to be approved by town board. When there is a um, replacement in term, uh, the the board of trustees essentially appoint the replacement and that person serves the remainder of the existing term. Um, those are two different portions of education law. Uh, the first one specifically libraries. The second one is all trustees for boards of ed boards of education. So um, I don't know if there was anything in terms of, yeah, I, I don't know that she was actually gonna mention the selection of Brandon or not, or I didn't know if, we, did we do a search or was it someone who's been working with the board? Um, I think that they're kind of always on the lookout. Um, gotcha. so I think it was a, someone who has, is new to the area and is interested in working with libraries. Great. Can you say that louder so I'm that- I'm sorry, he does, he does work with, a li with library systems right now because he knew quite a few of the people. Right. Okay, that makes sense. Good candidate, though. Thank, thanks, Jen. Um, for number twenty-four, uh, we're basically looking to close the capital project fund for the West Wing. So, uh, all the punch list items were ticked off, um, completed. 
Um, so we're ready to close it out. Don't know if you have anything you want to add to that, Linda, or to the personnel items. Uh, no, on the West Wing, we made the final payment to the general contractor maybe about a month and a half ago. So that is final. And then personnel, uh, we have a new hire in the rec center and then some seasonal part time. And one is just a move from one department to the other. And right. uh, from my way to buildings and grounds. Any questions? Mike, it looks like you've got Yes, Bill's payable again. Yep. Uh, was there something I was going to talk under old business? I swear there was something because Jenny said thank you because then otherwise I'd have to go to another page. Oh, look, it did go to another page. Minutes. <laughs> um, Yeah, I can't remember if there was something. I'm trying else. to think. I feel like there was something, but I uh, am blanking on what that thing is. Yeah, it's too late in the meeting for me to recall. <laughs> um, it wasn't anything major, though. It was just it was a follow up to something we had talked about in the past. But I guess I'll just send out. I'll bring it up oh, Wednesday. Okay. If I remember it, I'll bring it up Wednesday. Uh, can I get a motion to approve the minutes? I make a motion to approve the minutes from May 10th, 2021. Seconded. Any discussion? Yes, um, just so you, I, um, I don't see him here, but I, I did read through him. I was on, I just couldn't talk. Um, okay. I think it was through YouTube. I think it was YouTube I was getting to and, I, and it's listed on there that I wasn't able to attend, but I was probably had 90% of the meeting. So I'm not sure how fine. Either. Yeah, I, I marked it that way because uh, because you're not able to participate on YouTube. So I wasn't sure um, since you weren't able to vote or anything on YouTube, um, but I can change the note however anybody would like. Why don't we just note that uh, he was listening in Remotely. Uh, or What's that? Remotely. Yeah, listening in remotely and un but unable to vote. Mm -hmm. Is that okay, Miss? That sounds work. That sounds right. Okay. And uh, do you need me one. to say that again, or did you get it? Got it. It was short enough. I jotted it down quick. Okay. So should, should I vote on? It? Should I abstain, or should I, I will? Well, uh, I will make the motion that we uh, amend the minutes as I just proposed. Second. Second. Any further discussion on the amendment? Hearing none, can you please call the roll on the amendment? So this is to change the notation on the minutes. Council Member Barley. Aye. Council Member Stafford. Aye. Council Member Safranic. Aye. Council Member Bolzner. Aye. Supervisor Schultz. Aye. Okay, so now we are voting on the minutes uh, with that amendment in it. Any further discussion on the, the minutes? Hearing none, please call the roll. Council Member Barley? Aye. Council Member Stafford? Aye. Council Member Safranic? Aye. Council Member Bolzner? Aye. Supervisor Schultz? Aye. Uh, last, we'll be going into executive session, and our plan is to um, adjourn straight from executive session. Um, this is regarding uh, litigation uh, due, it was involving a car accident uh, during plowing operations years ago. Um, so we'll go into the details we got to have some discussion about that our, our the attorneys from nimer uh wanted to talk to us about how we want to deal with that so um so like i said we'll be going in an executive session we'll adjourn to executive session and then we'll adjourn straight from there so once we adjourn to executive session we'll be ending this broadcast for the evening uh anything else before we do so then can I get a motion to adjourn to executive session? 
So moved. Second. Hearing no objection, uh, open part of the meeting adjourned.